In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. <coughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among us, and blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. <coughs> Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kin within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Amen. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Paul and Terry. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father. So. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> The consecration program that you followed um, and you're finishing up uh, consists on meditation on the mission of the rosary, which is a very good summary of the life of Christ. Um, apologetically, if anyone ever asks you, who's a non-believer, uh, what is the Catholic Christian faith? I mean, there's so much that can be said, but if you explain to them the Mission of the Rosary, it's a pretty good darn start. Pretty good start because it, get, it shows you the beginning of the life of Christ, which would be his infancy, and the very heart of that would be, of course, the birth of Christ. Then you have his public life, which would be the, the luminous mysteries, baptism of Christ, the wedding feast of Cana, the proclamation of the kingdom, the Transfiguration, then the um, institution of the Eucharist. Then you enter into what is called the, the, the Paschal Mystery. Paschal Mystery would be the passion and death of Christ, but also which culminates in, we might call it the apex, or the, or the um, zenith would be the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Then we added the seven sorrows of Mary, which we tried to explain some of those mysteries last uh, last week. The um, presentation of our Lord in the temple, or which is a prophecy, a prophecy of Simeon. The uh, flight into Egypt. The child that was lost for three days and three nights. The uh, encounter between Mary and Jesus on the way to the cross. Jesus uh, crucified and Mary underneath the cross. Then um, the Pietà of Michelangelo, Jesus lowered in the arms of Mary. And then finally the separation of Jesus uh, from Mary, the burial. So that's, um, that's the program. Uh, given that we have this last... Uh, talk, you made your consecration on Monday. Did you like the consecration? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, we try to make the ceremony as beautiful as possible uh, in the context of the Mass and then the imposition of the scapular, your, your consecration prayer. Um, then most people are pretty impressed by the Eucharistic Marian procession we have at the end. Mm -hmm. Even though it is a little bit, little bit lengthy. Um, uh, in other places where I go, in Spanish, usually it's even a little bit longer. Right, Yolanda? Usually it's, it's about three hours usually, but we did this one in two and a half hours. No? But it goes by very quickly. And I think the people are impressed by the Eucharistic procession and uh, walking with the Blessed Mother. And I was, uh, I think I was commenting to Mary or someone else that it was very um, providential because that's really what they do in Lourdes. Our Lady wanted processions and also you have the Eucharistic procession at night in Lourdes and that's actually where most of the most of the miracles uh, are not in the water, but rather through the 
exposition of the Blessed Sacrament and the blessing, which stands to reason because the water is important. But we can't say that the water is more important than the Blessed Sacrament, right? Mm -hmm. The holy water of Lourdes, and probably most of you have have gotten a bottle of holy water, holy water from Lourdes. That's uh, that's a, a a sacramental, whereas the Eucharist is a sacrament. There's a big difference. Now it's uh, basically trying to trying to live out your consecration on a daily basis. Hopefully you'll be able to really live it out to the fullest and and go deeper in this consecration. I've said, and I said, I think last uh, last class um, <clears throat> would be a good idea to try to uh, renew your consecration every every year. My first consecration I did in 1976. Okay, <laughs> before some of you were even born, no. <laughs> Which was kind of interesting because from that moment on, I wanted to become a priest. I've always wanted to become a priest, but it was just so clear. So I attribute uh, my vocation of priesthood to marrying consecration. I made it with my mom in New Hampshire. It was uh, August 15, 1976 in St. Mary's Church in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Yeah. Our consecration, it was, it was St. Louis de Montfort because I hadn't written the book yet, okay? <laughs> I hadn't written my own book yet, okay? I didn't know I was going to write that book. In 1976, no? And I had an inclination I might be a writer one day. And I always, as a child, I always wanted to do three things. I wanted to be a baseball player, a writer, and a priest. So <laughs> those are my three aspirations when I, when I was young, no? I was able to carry out those aspirations, at least to a limited degree. I'm a priest, I'm a writer, and I played baseball, at least on the university level. I, I wanted to be a Yankee, but no. no, no. I know that's a bad word for the people. Angelino's here, right? No. But Angel, even though his name is Angel, he likes the Yankees. No? Mm -hmm. The other day I was teaching a class of confirmation kids. And um, what we're talking about are the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven and hell, purgatory. And um, we're talking about heaven. And they asked the boys, they've got uh, about 30 of them today and about 30 tomorrow. Then on Friday, they've got about 40. Pretty big classes, no? And uh, we're going through the class, the lessons that I, I've actually, I actually wrote out a confirmation book, too. Hopefully it'll be published one day, I hope. And I told the kids, you know, who's in heaven? The Father. Yep. The Son. The Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Mary, right? Then the saints, yes. Then also I asked them, are the angels in heaven? And they all said yes. Now here's a difficult question. If the angels are in heaven, are the Yankees in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> Got that angel? <laughs> His name is Angel. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago, there was a team called the Devil Rays, and the devils were playing the angels. <laughs> There's one kid in my class. <clears throat> He's a real athlete. He hates the Yankees, no? And he loves the angels. So every time I say the word Yankee, he goes like this. <laughs> you know what I have in my room? I've got a statue of the Blessed Mother, the Sacred Heart. I got a statue of my mom, my dad. Then I got a baseball. Signed by Mickey Mantle. Oh, 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 oh. The Mick. The Mick. The Mick. <laughs> Have you ever heard of, you've heard of Mickey Mantle? Yeah, baseball signed by Mickey Mantle. That'd be Mike Trout here, okay? <laughs> now the ball, uh, they say one of the uh, hardest balls ever hit in baseball was in Detroit, where I was born. 
and he's hit by Mickey Mantle, and the ball was going out of the stadium like a, like a Barry Bonds one, no? Mm -hmm. And it hit the back of the bleachers in center field, and it rolled all the way back to the pitcher's mound. Whoa. You know anything about baseball? A lot of the home runs, they're going over the fence like an arc. Mm -hmm. That was going up like a skyrocket. <laughs> so it hit, it had this, and it, it had so much force and momentum, rolled all the way back to the pitcher's mound. <laughs> but the pitcher couldn't throw him out. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to do something to, uh, this evening, given that it's uh, kind of an interesting class. We've already consecrated ourselves to Mary. Um, let me give a, a, a talk on Mary that I've never really given formally. But I, I've, I've written on this. I've written an art, article or two on this. I think you're going to find it interesting. Is um, usually during Lent, I will give um, I'll give a talk, and uh, a lot of it is taken from Fulton Sheen on the seven last words of Christ. Do you know them, Alicia? I didn't think so. Do you know the seven last words of Christ? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I thirst. Uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. Amen, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. You got those memorized, Jessica? Okay. I have to, have to hear them a second time, right? Okay, th so those are, those are the seven last words of Christ, and Fulton Sheen has commented upon them. I would like to do this, with your permission. Let's talk about the seven words of Mary. No. Just the seven. So very few people know this, and maybe that'll be my next book, okay? Is Mary in the Bible Mary in the Bible speaks seven times. Would you like to know those words? Yeah. That's gonna be my course today. That'll be my lecture, okay? So I'm gonna give you the seven words and after each one I'll give you um a brief commentary and then well, then we'll, con we'll conclude. So she spoke uh, seven times in, in sacred scripture. One of the words you would, uh, you would never be able to pick up, but uh, once I tell it, you say, oh, that is true. It is a word of Mary. So let's start. You ready? Ready. First, well, the first word is in the Annunciation. Okay, is the Annunciation found in Luke chapter one? The angel appears to Mary and says, "Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you." And the angel says, "You'll conceive and bring forth the Son, and the name of that Son is Jesus, because He will save the people from their sins." Okay, with that, with that context, Mary says this, how can this be since I do not know man? That's Mary's first word. How can this be since I do not know man? Okay, let's give an interpretation to that. Mary being, Harry, Mary being highly intelligent and totally dedicated to God's service, Mary made a promise. And what was that promise? It was a promise of what's called perpetual virginity. Mary wanted to be a virgin bride of the Holy Spirit. 
So Mary, hearing the angel say, she had, made the, the, she had made this as a solemn vow, a solemn promise, moved by the Holy Spirit. So if she's going to make a vow of virginity, the angel says she, she can have a child, she's reasoning, well, how is this going to happen? Mary's using reason. God wants us to use reason. In other words, she did, not want to, she did not want to break her promise to God. She made a promise, she wanted to keep it. How can this happen since I do not know man? I have had not relations with man. Okay, then the angel intervenes and says, Listen, your cousin Elizabeth, she who was known to be sterile, is already in her sixth month because no, no, there's nothing impossible with God. And then the angel says, and you, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. That which is conceived in you will be of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's, uh, let, let's, let, let's apply this to ourselves. We want to ask Mary to give us the grace of great purity and also that we'll also be faithful to our promises. Okay? So that's an interpretation for us. Pray that we'll be able to live out the beatitude, blessed are the pure of heart for they will see God and that, that we will be faithful to our promises. And if we have broken our promises, we'll never give in to discouragement but rather we will repent, return to God, we will confess, and we will, nunc cepi, we will start a new life. So that's the first word and my practical interpretation for you people. Okay? So this is a novelty. You've never heard anyone give a talk on the seven words of Mary. Hmm? Okay, the second would be this. Still in the context of the Annunciation, it's a st the same mystery. After listening to word the words of the angel, understanding that she's not going to break her vow, but she's going to keep her vow, Mary gives consent. And she says the words that we say in the Angelus. And the words that Mary say are, David, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. Up to that point in time, those were the most important words in the history of the world. I think we really underestimate those words. Up to that point, those were the most important words in the history of the world. And our salvation hinged upon those words. Do you realize what happened with those words? St. Bernard, who is known as the mellifluous doctor, one of the most, if you like language, well, I love language, you know, the most beautiful meditation on this mystery, probably in the history of Catholicism. He presents the angel Gabriel talking to Mary, and he has another scene. He has all the angels up in heaven looking down on Mary waiting for Mary in total silence. And then once Mary says, yes, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, can imagine the explosion of joy in heaven, then Jesus dismisses himself from God the Father and he descends 
from the heights of heaven to earth, to Palestine, to Galilee, to Nazareth. Mary is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, as a little baby, enters into the heart of Mary. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was the moment of the incarnation of the Son of God. We can be saved. Be saved. We can be saved. We can go to heaven because of the yes of Mary. For that reason, reason, we should be eternally grateful for Mary's yes. Otherwise, none of us could be saved. That's why she's known as the co-redemptrix. Okay, let's see. Let's let's go from <clears throat> the mystical, the sublime. to ourselves now. Pope John Paul II, in one of his uh, writings on the Eucharist, makes a parallel between Mary's yes and the Annunciation and our amen when you receive Holy Communion. Yeah. Okay. Gabrielle, let's explain that. So when Mary said yes, what happened was Mary received Holy Communion. What is Holy Communion? It's receiving God into your heart. So every time, John Paul II says this, every time the priest says to the body of Christ, and you say, Amen, the same thing is happening. You're receiving Jesus into the depths of your heart. So there's a real parallel between Mary's yes in the Annunciation, and your Amen every time you receive Holy Communion. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes. It's not Father of Rome, that's, Father, that's John Paul II, okay? <laughs> Love that insight. He makes the analogy of the parallel between Mary saying, Behold the handmaid Lord, and receiving Jesus into her heart. That's Holy Communion, receiving God into one's heart, and the body of Christ, Amen. So you have a Eucharistic incarnation every time you receive Holy Communion. So let's let's finish that idea. I made this uh, I made this point uh, uh, in last class, either this class or the Sunday class. Is living out our consecration to Mary is also receiving communion through the heart of Mary. Some of you even go to daily Mass. I see some of you. Do you really want to upgrade, improve your communions? Then receive communion through the heart of Mary. And you're going to notice a difference. Even tomorrow. Try to. Try to do that. You go up to communion in the state of grace, Jesus is happy. But if you go up to communion walking hand in hand with Mary, and Mary gives you her heart? No comparison. Try to do it. Try to do it. As the Mother Teresa of Calcutta says, Mary, give me your heart that I'll be able to love Jesus with your immaculate heart. See, there are so many graces that God has available for us, but because of lack of education in the faith, we're never going to receive these graces unless we're educated. So I made a decision, until I die, I'm going to be preaching and confessing around the clock. 
Okay. Um, I made a decision. I'm going to be preaching and teaching around the clock. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, because there, 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 there's a lot of hum, hunger for God, but someone has to teach us, right? Yeah. God has given me, you know, a, you know, give me a title in philosophy, theology. I'll, I'll give it to you free of charge. No, why not, right? Pope Francis says that one of the greatest graces, acts of charity that can be done is to give people the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Greatest act of charity, give people the word of God. And the interesting thing, this is Thomas Aquinas. Now, if I were to open my wallet and give you $10, I'm $10 poorer. But if I give you the word of God, I'm not more poor. You're richer, and I've been even more richer the more I preach the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not impoverishing myself now. I'm enriching myself by sharing with you the Word of God. You want to really want to show love, give people the Word of God? As frequently and as abundantly as you can. Okay. Third word. Ready? Okay, so the third uh, word, uh, this is the one that no one would pick up unless I, t unless I teach you. We're talking about the seven, seven words of Mary. So we move from the Annunciation to the Visitation. And the visitation, there's actually two different words of Mary. One is very short, the other is the longest, the longest expression we have of Mary in the whole Bible, which is about 10 verses in the Bible. Let's start with the shortest one. You know what it would be? What do you think? You don't know how oh, that's right. You know? Can I tell you? Shalom. Shalom. Okay, so in the context of the visitation, uh, you have to pick this up through, through impl implication. It's implicit rather than explicit. So Mary, after the, she conceives Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, Mary goes in haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. She walks about 80 kilometers, which is about 55 miles, traveling to the hill country, Ein Karin, 55 miles. And when she arrives, the visitation says that Mary greeted Elizabeth. Now, greeted Elizabeth. Okay, uh, l listen to this. Bonjour. Buongiorno. Ruth Scott. Guten Morgen. Que <laughs> tal? Buenos dias. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. So I've spoken in about seven different languages. No? <clears throat> I spoke to you in French and Italian and a little bit of German and Argentinian Spanish and Mexican Spanish and I spoke a little bit of American English too. <laughs> now the ways that the Jew, the ways that the Hebrew people would greet each other would be with the word Shalom. And Shalom uh, means peace be with you. Peace be with you. So it says Mary greeted Elizabeth. We can imply by that greeting that Mary probably said shalom. That was part of her culture. And, and saying peace be with you is a very beautiful greeting, isn't it? No? So that's the third word. 
How are we going to apply that? Okay, a couple ideas. We want to be living out one of the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Hmm? Shalom, peace be with you. Blessed are the peacemakers. We want to try, in as much as we can, to be men and women of peace. You know, Gabriel Fulton Sheen, he says that the, the world war, you know where it begins? This is Fulton Sheen, your friend. He says, you have a war within your heart because of sin. You transmit this to your family, then family to the community, then community to the state, the state to the country, country to the continent. When you have enough of these interior wars that are being transmitted, boom, the atomic bomb falls. At Fulton Sheen. So the world wars are a consequence of many interior wars that are waging in the hearts of individual people. What do you think? That's Fulton Sheen. I love Sheen. Isn't he great? Great thinker, isn't he? So we want to do the exact opposite. We, we don't want to be causes of war. We want to be causes of peace. Now, how does, uh, how does your friend, I think he's your friend, St. Augustine, how does he define peace? Would you like to know? I yeah. thought so. I'll tell you. <laughs> peace is the tranquility of order. That's Augustinian definition. Peace is the tranquility of order. Okay, annotation number one of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. He speaks about one of the primary purposes of the spiritual exercises is to order the disordered. We all have disorders in our life, right? Mm -hmm. To order the disordered. Take one more step. Do you have devotion to Our Lady Guadalupe? I thought you did. What did a lady do when Juan Diego cut those roses and he threw them in his tilma? What did she do? You know? She touched them, but more than touched them. David? She arranged them. In an orderly fashion? In an orderly fashion. Okay, so she arranged them in an orderly fashion. In the tilma. In the tilma. So if we want to have order in our lives, we want to place ourselves in the hands of Mary, right? Yes. Mary will help us to order the disorder. Yeah. So that word shalom, those are well, three or four interpretations of it and applications to our lives. One last idea would be this. Um, <clears throat> Pope Francis wrote <coughs> uh, a document it's called, <coughs> called The Joy of the Gospel. <clears throat> and I went through this two and a half years in my class on Wednesday, The Joy of the Gospel. If we really want the gospel to take root in the hearts of people, we've got to be joyful. Ready, Melda? We don't want to have, as they say in Argentinian Spanish, la cara de vinagre. Uh, in other words, if we have Christ within us, like Mary, we want to give Christ to others with joy. One of the, one of the, one of the clearest signs that we are followers of Jesus Christ is having a smile on your face. Yep. A radiant smile on your face, one of the most clear evidences that we're following that. You got one. Good. 
And you know, a smile is contagious. If you look at that guy with a smile, he's going to smile back. <laughs> he didn't even look at you. He looked at me and he smiled back, huh? <laughs> yeah, smile is contagious. You smile at Abel. Oh, poor little kid. Ah, oh, mommy, thank you. Come on. So Mary teaches us uh, that uh, to win souls to Christ, we have to have joy within our hearts, which flows out in our exterior demeanor, okay? our countenance. Right. So there we have the third word. Ready for the fourth? So Mary uh, greets Elizabeth and... <clears throat> You probably know, you know the next uh, part of the, of the scene is that uh, Elizabeth says, um, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? At the sign of your greeting, the baby leapt in my soul. Blessed are you among women, and blessed the fruit of your womb. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And then after this, after Mary hears, the words of this prophetic woman, Elizabeth. Mary opens up her mouth and she <coughs> offers to us one of the most beautiful prayers in the whole Bible, which I have been saying every night for the past 40 years of my life. <coughs> it is called the Magnificat. We as priests and religious, we pray this on a daily basis, what is called Vespers or evening prayer. And Mary says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, who has looked upon the lowliness of his hand. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful prayer. All generations will call me blessed because the Almighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And holy is his name. Okay, so what can we learn from this? Uh, St. Louis de Montfort in True Devotion to Mary applies this to Holy Mass, Holy Communion, and Thanksgiving after Mass. So after we have received Holy Communion, we talk about receiving Holy Communion through Mary's, Behold, the hand may the Lord be done to me according to the word. Mary prepares us for Holy Communion. Mary prepares us to receive Jesus well. But also, the Magnificat Mary teaches us how to praise and thanks Jesus after we receive Holy Communion. Yep. And if you really reflect upon it, the greatest gesture, action in our life is to receive Holy Communion. So Mary prepares us to receive Holy Communion and she gives us the grace to make an excellent thanksgiving by the Magnificat. So if you see, Mary, Mary's never pushing us away from Christ. Mary is always bringing us closer to Christ. You know, that, that, that accusation, it, it, it hurts me and it makes me angry. You know? You're praying so much to Mary, you're going to be forgetting about Jesus. I get, I get angry at that. No? And you've heard it too. Even among Catholics. I mean, you, by loving Mary, we're not going to be diminishing our love for Christ. The more we love Mary, the more we love Christ. Yes. For example, if you, if, if you say something kind about my mother, I'm not jealous about that. I'm happy about it. Jessica says something good about her mother, that's great. You say something of, of something kind about your mother, there's nothing wrong with that. And what are the words? What are the words that Mary says? My soul 
Okay, there's a lot of interpretations, but if you go to the go to the Latin, the original Greek is my soul magnifies. <coughs> I think that that's the best translation. My soul magnifies the Lord. I love that. Uh, that's what's called the Magnificat. If you go to Latin, right? My soul does magnify the Lord. <coughs> Before all, before all those electronic devices, so these young whippersnappers don't remember that, but um, <laughs> let's see, maybe, who, who, may, oh, my age. Okay. You remember the magnifying glass we used to use oh, back yes. in the 60s? Yes. No? You probably don't even know what that is, no? <laughs> Do you know what it is? Yes. Yes. <laughs> una, una lupita in Spanish? Yes. Lupa or lupa? Lupa. Okay, lupa. Okay. It's a lupa in Spanish, no? I remember as a kid, you'd have that magnifying glass and you'd be, you know, on uh, uh, the hot day, the sun going through it and starting a little fire on a leaf, no? Okay. Uh, I, I, I remember even my, my grandmother who lived to be 100 and, 104, at the end of her life her eyes weren't as good and she'd be reading the newspaper with a magnifying glass. So the letters there in the Detroit Herald, she's able to see them a little bit bigger using that magnifying glass. So what does Mary do? She doesn't magnify the letters or magnify the leaves. Mary magnifies God. She magnifies God. So if you want to magnify God, you do it through the heart of Mary. Hmm? My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul magnifies the Lord. So next time you receive Holy Communion, it's up to you. You could say that prayer. Maybe try to memorize that prayer. I mean, they've turned that into a song, right? Especially the charismatics, right? But use that as a means to magnify Christ in your lives, but maybe most especially after Holy Communion. So there we have, we have four of the words of Mary. Got three to go. Okay, Gabrielle, you are a walking dictionary, okay, encyclopedian. Yeah. What would be the fourth? What would be the fifth? You got it. Great, yeah. Okay, perfect. And what would the words be? Why have you done this to us, my son? Why have you done this to us? You got it. <laughs> Pretty good. Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been searching for you in sorrow. Pretty good. Not bad. We usually jump, you, most people jump, well, we'll jump to John chapter 2, but that's the one that's found in Luke chapter 2. Son, why have you done this to us? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in sorrow. Okay, what does this mean to us? is that, like Mary, we should be striving to get to know Jesus better and better. Okay? Like Mary, striving to get to know Jesus better and better. And how is this done? One way in which this is done we read in Luke chapter 2 at the, uh, with the shepherds and this one says, Mary, for her part, she pondered these things in her heart. She pondered these things in her heart. That's the good way to get to know Jesus better. 
What is that? By being faithful to your holy hour. Yes. <laughs> being faithful to your holy hour. Being faithful to your meditation every day. And don't follow your feelings, just, just be faithful. The same has been al pie del cañón. Okay, you got to be faithful there, okay? Al pie del cañón, right? You're faithful there. You're there. Day in, day out, day out. Now, if you go to the Greek, uh, the, the word pondering in the Greek would be um, to ruminate. And the ruminate is, uh, did you ever see a cow chewing the cud? In a vaca, masticando la paca. You got a cow, they're chewing the cud. That's actually the word that's used in Greek. Now what a cow does when the cow has a <coughs> stuffs hay in his mouth, he's going to be what? Masticating it. Chewing it and chewing it and chewing it and chewing it. Almost pulverizing it. That's the word. So meditating means you, you're reading, you're thinking, you're pondering. You're reading, you're thinking, you're pondering, you're trying to make sense out of it. What it means is this. Meditation, sometimes it takes a lot of work. Don't feel that, you know, right away you're, you're a born mystic, okay? And you're going to start to elevate, you know, the first time you've done your holy hour, no? You're going to start to have ecstasies and visions of the white beard of God the Father, okay? And we're going to see the dove flying in high, okay? It's just not the way, you know, prayer, uh, prayer takes a lot of work. I'll never forget in 1986 when I arrived in Buenos Aires for my first assignment, I was a priest, a baby priest of about three months. My, uh, my superior, who passed away about a year ago, Father Fontana, we were talking about prayer and he said, you make, for, make sure you're faithful to prayer. I never forgot the analogy he gave to me. He said, prayer can sometimes be as difficult as pushing a wheelbarrow full of cement up a high mountain. Yeah. I remember as a kid, my dad would give us wheelbarrow rides after we did a lot of work, no? He'd have the, he'd have the wheelbarrow filled with dirt because he was always working with our with our um, with our lawn, we'd have to you know st we'd have to plant a new lawn every spring. You know? three quarters of an acre there in, in Jersey, you know, and it'd be filled with with dirt, and we'd have to kind of put. But try to imagine it, not dirt but cement, but pushing it up a, a huge hill. You know? That was my, my superior said. Meditation is sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? Is sometimes it's hard work. It's hard work, but you got to persevere. So that's my interpretation of that verse, is that uh, we have to s seek Christ through assiduous, daily, methodical, faithful meditation. Right, Imelda? An amen? Amen or oh me? Amen. That's an amen. <laughs> that's an amen. Okay, Gabrielle, you're in a role. You are really on a roll. What's the sixth word? Let's see if you can hit the nail on the head. The, um, He's on a roll. The the Pretty good. So we jumped from Luke 2 to John 2. Okay, you've got the context. So we're in the wedding feast of Cana. And there Jesus is with Mary and the apostles. And... Uh, do, you, do, you, do you know why they ran out of wine? <laughs> Fulton Sheen says, the, apost the apostles crashed the sea and they took all the wine. <laughs> Those big burly fishermen, they crashed in and they went to town. No, no that, that's a joke, okay. <laughs> 
they ran out of wine. Let's don't, let's don't blame the apostles, right? Oh, God, come on. See the apostle looking down at me, Father Rome, no, no. <laughs> we drank, we drank as Thomas Aquinas with moderation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the moderate use of created goods. That's what Thomas Aquinas. He, are they going to say this? Thomas Aquinas wasn't born yet, though, was he? <laughs> okay, uh, well, Gabrielle, you, 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 you're, you're warm, but you, hit, you haven't hit the nail on that. What are the words? Ah, no. You're, you're jumping over a word. No, you're jumping over a word. Alicia knows, no. Okay, good. So, yeah, you're, you're jumping over to less. Mary looks at the scene and she says, Son, there's no more wine. You're jumping the gun, okay? Okay, son, there's no more wine. So in some of these phrases, they're, they're two in one passage, okay? As you have in the Annunciation, you have in the Visitation. And so three of them, they're two in one verse. <laughs> oh, okay. She was long yawning. I was thinking, there's, there's a Mexican phrase, la boca cerrada no entra las moscas. You got to translate that to her, okay? You know, you ever hear that one? La boca cerrada no entra moscas. <laughs> you want me to translate it? If, you're, if your mouth is closed, flies won't enter in. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So let's go. Running out of wine. Okay. This is a, this is a beautiful passage in which all of us, sometimes it seems if our wine runs out. We feel sad, we feel depressed, we're in desolation, there's no consolation, we're kind of in a dark tunnel, we seem to be in um, the Beatles' uh, No Man's Land, okay? Okay, uh, or if you're an English major studying T.S. Eliot, you're in, a, you're in what's called the wasteland, okay? <laughs> you seem to be, you seem to be in, in a cloud. It seems as if God seems to be absent from you. It seems to be such that, you know, God, where are you? God, why are you hiding your face? He's there. He's there. But it seems as if he's not. <coughs> so in that moment, that's when you have water in your life. Ask Mary to turn your water into wine. There you have it. Right, David? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ask Mary to turn your water into wine. Ask Mary to help you to go from desolation to consolation. And also, when you have that desolation, that dark night, the cloud, then go in front of Mary, sit down or kneel down, open up and talk to Mary. If you like, you can even offer your sorrow, you can offer your... <coughs> Suffering, you offer your tears to Mary. Offer your tears to Mary, las lagimas. Yeah? And Mary will listen to you. And through her prayers, she'll help you to carry your cross and help you to cope with your suffering. And when God sees fit, to move you from the desolation to the consolation. That's part, of our, that's part of our consecration is in the difficult moments in our life, we don't want to be clinging 
to this inner turmoil, but we want to learn how to talk it out with Mary. Have a nice statue or painting in your house, in your room, and open up and talk to Mary. Talk to Mary. Give Mary your all. Give her everything you have. Classic literature presents a, a beautiful little short story of Mary, written by Anatole France. And it's uh, something you could probably read in about 15 minutes. And it's called The Juggler of Notre Dame. Have you read Alicia? The Juggler of Notre Dame is this. There was a young man that wanted to become a religious. He didn't have too many talents. So he tried to enter into a religious community and they didn't accept him. Then he tried another, was rejected. Tried a third, they wouldn't accept him. He just didn't have any talents. So after knocking at a lot of convents, he knocked at one door and the religious superior, having pity on him, let him come in. And um, he's kind of a klutz. He couldn't learn. He um, you know, tried to work in the kitchen and he would be burning the potatoes. I mean, uh, he did, basically did everything wrong. Kind of a klutz. You know? And uh, they put up with him, but he didn't seem to be doing anything right. One night, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, they couldn't find him in his room, and he was in the refectory. And what was happening was, Father Superior came out and saw him. He was there in the refectory at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he was juggling. He was juggling. And all of a sudden, the Blessed Mother appeared. She saw, him, she saw him juggling, a big smile on her face. Then another brother came, and he kept juggling. And Mary was there with a big smile on her face. And then in time, the whole community was there, and he, he had his back to the whole community. And he was juggling, and the Blessed Mother were looking at the monks, and he was juggling. And he juggled to his heart content. And that's the end of the story. The only thing he could do was juggle. And he would do his juggling stunts to, for the Blessed Mother. We are all called, we're all called to be the juggler of Notre Dame. What is that gift or talent that we can give to the Blessed Mother? Maybe we, we can't give her a, a million dollar check at the end of this class. Maybe we can't be writing for her some Shakespearean sonnets, no? Maybe none of us are a Michelangelo in disguise. Maybe none of us can hit a baseball like Mickey Mantle. But we can all offer Mary, our hearts. And that's what's most important. Offering her our hearts. That's what the Juggle of Notre Dame teaches us. To give Mary the best that we have. And that's enough. Giving her our best. In the eyes of the world, it may not appear to be something very important, but Mary looks at the depths of her heart. A heart that's pure, clean, a heart that's filled with love, and Mary takes that with great joy. Okay? Okay, the last word, Gabriel, you're on a roll. Go for it. What would, what would it be? Uh, whatever you, tell you got it. John 2, verse 5. Mary says, 
Do whatever he tells you. Those are the last words recorded of Mary in sacred scripture. What happened was uh, they bring these six stone jars filled to the brim and Mary, these were the, they're brought to Jesus and Jesus turns this water into the best of wine. And the waiter said, usually they serve the best wine first, but after they drunk, they give the cheaper wine. They won't know the difference, huh? But you've held on to the best wine until last. And it concludes the wedding feast of, Can of Cana, and the disciples believed because of this. So as a result of this, the apostles' faith was growing and growing and growing. So I'd like to give you uh, an interpretation of this. Those last words of Mary would be the best advice that was ever given in the history of the world. Do whatever he tells you. Can you tell me better advice than that? We would simply put into practice those few words of Mary this world would already be paradise on earth. The essence of the problem of the world is that very few people put into practice those last words of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do whatever he tells you. So let's pray for the grace to live out our consecration to Jesus through Mary by living out those words as best as we possibly can. Do whatever he tells you. So hope and I pray that this consecration program will leave an indelible impression on your lives, on your hearts, and your whole beings. That you recognize that you're never alone. You're never alone walking beside you at all times, in all places, in all moments, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. You're in the best company, and Mary's going to help you on the highway to heaven. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, and the hour of our death. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. And if you like, we're going to be starting the spiritual exercises just in a couple of days. Mary will probably know to feel about you. We'll be starting next uh, uh, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, and Thursday. If you'd like to come, we'd love to have you. So God bless you. And I'd like to also thank our facilitator for their work. Thank you very much.